This autoethnography provides a portal into KadeshaCraft through the use of text, photos, and video to portray my experience participating in a Kadesha Craft training and initiation as the only woman among three other pilgrims who went through the immersive erotic theater production of A Midsummer Temple Dream. Kadesha Craft incorporates archetypical embodiment, psychodrama techniques, heightened states of arousal, and other methods that alter or calm the body and mind to enable the participants, which are referred to as pilgrims, to transcend the mundane, step outside of themselves, and rewrite personal mythologies to create what Turner refers to as communitas, a culture of liberated and connected beings. Proponents of the Kadesha craft emerged from the sacred sexuality movement that is spreading worldwide through organisms such as the International School of Temple Arts and transformational events such as Burning Man. They believe that prior to 7 BCE, the sexual and sacred were combined in temples as healing and bonding community forces. However, with the rise of patriarchy came the destruction of goddess worship and their temples, changing the meaning of Kadesha from priestess to prostitute, as it remains in modern Hebrew. They postulate that the loss of the sacred sexual practices has contributed to a mind-body split that causes separation, alienation, and trauma that leads to domination, lack of creativity, and threatens survival and flourishing both of individuals and culture. Kraft, which means power in German, refers to a set of socially defined skills and practices that develops capabilities and knowledge, physical, conceptual, and social, that creates or changes things, such as the psyche of the self or others, relationships, or culture. The developers of Kadesha Kraft, which includes therapists, actors, and activists, as well as scholars, hope that by cultivating immersive environments and experiences that ignite eros, enhance liminality, and facilitate connection, individual and cultural transformation that encourages partnership, co-creation, and healing will occur. Prior to the performance, four of the founders participated in psychodrama training. The cast and crew were offered two sessions of trauma-informed education. All participated in a week-long Kadesha craft training and initiation in which I was invited to be part of. One of the key assumptions of psychodrama is that we are wounded socially, therefore we must heal socially. The script combined elements from Shakespeare's Midsummer Dream with Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. It included four scenes custom designed for each pilgrim called ordeals. Each ordeal was developed based on a series of initial interviews with the pilgrims about our traumas, lives, goals, and blocks. Each pilgrim was assigned to Kadesha to accompany us through the performance and to provide support before and after the ordeals. The Pilgrim's initiation took place in a remote area of Colorado over a period of 48 hours. It followed the steps of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey and our personally designed ordeals were interspersed with community events and theatrical performances. There was a cast and crew of 33 people who were involved in creating this experience for the four of us. For me, the call came several weeks before the event when the director asked if I would consider doing an ethnography and documenting the event. Realizing that it was too late to get human subjects clearance, I said I couldn't interview the other pilgrims. However, I could write about my own experience as a pilgrim in the event. However, once I accepted the call to participate in the event as a pilgrim, I began to question the implications. How would I write about the fulcrum between academia and the language of sex? Would I be expected to have sex? What would really be involved in the event? It wasn't clear. 
their materials for advertising participation in the event were obscure and enticing. A few months previously, I had turned 60 and I decided that I was going to spend the year of 60 exploring and fully engaging in my body instead of my mind. Having been on an academic career path for so many years, I wanted to get more into the body and feel more alive. So I found myself in a limousine on the way to the event in Colorado. A message comes through my phone. It's my Kadesha sending me the results of his STD test. I was supposed to get one too, but with the end of the semester busyness and perhaps a little subconscious blocking, I wasn't able to do it or didn't, which heightened my anxiety. An anxiety that continued to accelerate through the pre-event training in Kadesha Craft. The three axioms, Kadeshas are sex shamans, that there's a therapeutic orientation that's hoping to create transformation in the pilgrims, and that we are creating a co, co-creating a new reality, all lingered with me as I scrutinized my own motivations and expectations regarding the event. The space was one of interaction, integrated community, and erotic energy. Sex seemed to be everywhere, in the bodies of the actors and actresses who were all stunning and young and full of verve, and even in nature as I tried to stroll through the forest to relax myself in anticipation of what was to come. Being in the week-long training gave me clues to what was ahead of me as a pilgrim, but when actual discussions of the ordeals or details of the performance went on, I was asked to leave the room. And finally, during the dress rehearsal, I was taken away from the site and stayed at an Airbnb where I got to linger in my own thoughts about the meaning of it all and what it could be. To prepare myself for my role as the ethnographer in residence, as well as to alleviate some of my anxiety about what would be in front of me as a pilgrim, I turned to books and articles about ritual, theater, and erotic performance. I was now fully in the test phase of Campbell's hero's journey. I came across the following phrase in Victor Turner's Ritual Theater. If anthropologists are ever to take ethnogematics seriously, our discipline will have to become something more than a cognitive game played in our heads and inscribed in, let's face it, somewhat tedious journals. We will have to become performers ourselves and bring to human existential fulfillment what we have heretofore too been only mental protocols. We must find ways of overcoming the boundaries of both political and cognitive structures by dramatic empathy, sympathy, friendship, even love. Tough call. Performance anxiety was definitely kicking in. What if I couldn't perform? A cast of 33 people sweating, rehearsing, giving so much of their time and energy to create this experience, what would be expected of me? Would I choke? I was concerned about vaginal atrophy. The idea that thinning tissues and lack of estrogen could lead to painful intercourse, bladder infections, tearing, ripping. Oh my God. Why hadn't we talked about this before? Why didn't I know about it? Certainly erectile dysfunction gets talked about a lot. Both happen to 50% of the population. 
at a certain point once we're aging. And yet, nobody talks about vaginal atrophy. Although we all signed consent forms that said we were part of a immersive theatrical experience and that sexual activity was not an expected or guaranteed part of that experience and that if sexual activity occurred on site, it was consensual. I worried about the legal, ethical, and professional implications for the other pilgrims, for the cast and crew, and for myself. I needed support. I called one of my former students, who's gay, now a PhD, who studied queer bars in China. We had a long talk about cultural change and healing and being outside of the, the law, outside of the boundaries and what it takes. I decided I would go forward and allow my eros to rise and deal with the implications later and decide what to tell and not to tell in my story. Besides, queer people have always been outside the law. And isn't that really where all change happens outside of cultural norms? We leave the normal cultural. We are jarred that there can be another reality, another way of being. And from that, seeds of transformation are sprouted. I found comfort reading ethnographies of sex work and allyship with other scholars whose work transcended the boundaries of what is acceptable or even legal. From this view, two con true confessions of field workers, identities, and involvement serve more than academic self-indulgence. They serve as essential components in any full accounting of field, work, field research knowledge. In the context of sexuality and science, Foucault describes the confession as one of the main rituals we rely on for the production of truth. In the present context, we can understand the field researcher's confession as an emerging ritual designed to flesh out the fieldwork experience and to produce situated understandings of the fieldwork research and field research findings previously submerged under mythologies of researcher objectivity and distance. Armed with new resolve with the way paved by other scholars, I met the other three pilgrims at the rendezvous point where a limousine came to pick us up. A bag was put over our head and we were taken to an undisclosed location where we were interrogated about our goals, motivations, and expectations for the event. I would surrender and state my deepest truth. My goal, pleasure. My motivation, the liberation of all beings. After the interrogation, I was taken to my room where I met my two Kadesha in person. Max, who was a comrade and a comforting force and a bit of a trickster. And Dream, who I would call Dragon who would call me queen, who sometimes I would call king, who would linger with me in my chambers, accompany me to the events the day before the ordeals, of which there were many that were thrilling and versatile, and eventually guide me to the porthole where I would go on alone in my journey. I wasn't allowed to bring my phone and I had to go through the door alone. After entering the door, I walked through the forest and came to a labyrinth. As I started to walk the labyrinth, characters appeared from among the shrubbery, each dressed as someone from my past. I had sent my Kadesha my memoir after one of the interviews when they were asking about my trauma, triggers, and expectations and hopes and dreams. 
I said, I'm probably the only pilgrim that comes with a handbook. They had read it, and the characters that emerged from the trees were speaking lines from my memoirs. They were dressed as my younger self, my teen self, my adult self, the minister who threatened hell, the kids who taunted me, telling me I was never good enough, my father, my mother, my mentors. It was powerful. All of a sudden, my life had sprouted into three dimensions and was part of a community. Inside, I felt like I'd belonged, like never before. In the middle of the labyrinth was my younger self, crying. As I, transver as I traversed the labyrinth, I got closer to them and eventually embraced them, integrating my adult self and my wounded child in full witness of all the characters from different phases of my life. My memoir, The Mother Road, is about my search for identity and belonging after finding out I was a black market baby. The next station that I found in the forest was a cabin. And when I entered it, a woman dressed as my birth mother and another as my adopted mother were fighting over my birth certificate, tugging at it. Finally, my birth mother relinquished my birth certificate to my adoptive mother, handing the infant that was swaddled in her arms at the same time. The actress who played my adoptive mother looked strikingly like my mother. All of a sudden reality became slippery. What was I really watching? At the final station of my ordeal, which was a nest built in the forest where I was joined by my two Kadeshas, a mystic came from the forest, shrouded in a hood, carrying a staff. He sat and laid before me a tarot deck and read my cards. The reading was strikingly similar to questions I'd had about my life that were currently unfolding. I felt aligned with the forces below me, above me, around me, and within me. A thunderstorm rolled in, and Max and I cuddled under a blanket and debriefed the experience, gently and softly landing in the present moment. How do I tell the story of what it is that is happening with these immersive erotic theater events. I can only tell my own story. I cannot speak for the other pilgrims. I know that the cast and crew are left with lingering questions. One of them being about the boundaries between the self and the other and what is expected through performance. I wasn't the only one with performance anxiety. I did hear from another pilgrim that they were concerned that they would not be able to perform and therefore take part in all the gifts that were being bestowed on them. I did hear from one of the Kadesha, actually three of them, that they were exhausted and that the balance between taking care of themselves and the other was a hard line to find. Marathon moments. Um, yeah, juggling, I th and I think this is as usual of both and, but it's like, I think this, I think doing these productions is like that. Like we work out and we train and then we get there and we run the marathon and after the marathon, you're really fucking tired <laughs> and like you recuperate, but it doesn't mean you don't run the marathon, you know. Another issue that is currently alive in the field are the gender expectations. Similar to pornography and the debate between whether feminist porn is actually liberating or oppressive, we wondered about the semiotics of some of the motifs in the event, as well as the way that gender roles were being played out. 
I was invited to the debriefing after the event in which we scrutinized these and other issues, including how we could make these performances available to more people. Clearly, in a capitalistic society, an event like this is expensive to produce and involves a lot of resources. As we discussed these issues and others, I noticed that I had changed my description of my own self from the ethnographer, from the participant observer, from the pilgrim, to a we aligned with the movement of the Kadesha. One question that comes up over and over again is whether or not we're really bringing about transformation with these events, both in individuals and culture. How does theater function? Is it art for art's sake? Or could it be like the hot tub diplomacy at Esteban, where when the Soviets went through individual transformation, they initiated changes that are believed to brought about perestroika. The question lingers also between performance and ritual. Is it all a performance or through ritual do we actually evoke an alignment between the divine and cosmic and natural forces? Clearly, there's a huge difference between a moment frozen in time and the engaged living moment of being, as these two shots illustrate. There's no easy answers to the questions and the contradictions and the paradoxes of a movement that attempts to create something that is art, that is change. We are left with an idea, which is always a scene of pathos, which I imagine and by which I am moved, in short, a theater. Addendum. The day I finished this presentation and put the last period behind the last reference, a storm blew up over the ocean, over 
my home. It came out of nowhere, suddenly and abrupt, blew through my house, blew the tablecloth off my dining room table, while a double rainbow appeared simultaneously. Magic? 